So God is good. God is good. He is. He is. He is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. All right. So um, let me let me just tell you what we're going to be doing here for the next couple of weeks. Um, tonight we're going to finish up the book of Romans, and, um, and and then next week we'll have just like a standalone message, which will be just a topical thing, just one isolated situation. And then for the next three weeks leading into Easter, we'll start a new series, and we're going to talk. You know, Jesus goes to the cross just before Easter, you know, and so he has to die. And so when he dies, uh, we're going to talk about for the for three weeks leading into Easter uh, things that need to be put to death. And, and, and so we're going to start a mini-series called Put It to Death. That's what we're going to do for three weeks. And then, of course, that'll lead us right into Easter, our Easter celebration, Living Life in Color. So we're going to go from extremely dark and extremely dreary to extremely wonderful and extremely bright and extreme life. And so that's what we're going to do for the next uh, month. But tonight, like I said, I want to I finish up the book of Romans. And, and, and so what we started back in June, this is crazy, June 16 of 2014, we started studying the book of Romans. And, and, and I was scared back then, and I'm still scared of it. I, I, the reason I was scared of the book is because it's, it's so thick with theology. It explains salvation to us. It tells us who God is so we can understand. And, and, and I was scared of it, though, because not only is it so thick with truth, but it's a highly controversial book. You know, Christians read it and they fight over all these different issues in the book. And I knew that when I went through it as promised, you know, subject by subject, chapter by chapter, I was going to run into stuff that I wasn't even sure about. You agree about something and I disagree and we're going back and forth. And I knew it and it didn't let us down. And it caused some, some, some discussion and dialogue, but I think that it's helped everybody. Now, uh, what I want to do is, is, is I want to reiterate what the first thing I said. The first thing I said when we started this book was that we wanted to understand the gospel because if you ask the general public, what's the gospel? Because it's the foundation of our church. It's the reason we exist, right? It's the reason we live. It's why the church even exists was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you need to understand what it is because most people, if you ask them, they'll just go, well, you know, um, Jesus is uh, perfect, and I'm not, and he died, and I get to go to heaven. Now, 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 that's true, but of course the gospel, as I hope we found out, is a lot thicker than that. There's a lot more to the gospel than just Jesus is good, I'm not, he dies, I live. There's more to it than that. Uh, tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give an overview from, from June 16 to this week, I don't know exactly how long that is, probably eight, eight months or something like that. I'm going to condense eight months into 45 to 50 minutes if that's possible, but I'm not going to go high. I'm not going to go real high theology stuff where we're going to get really into some real deep meaning, and I'm, not also, I'm also not going to go extremely low on the ground like application stuff. I'm not going to be pointing out a lot of things that we could do with this thing. So I'm just going to, like, if, if, you, if you could, could imagine like a hovercraft. Not too high, not too low, just somewhere along the ground, and we're just going to hover through it really as quickly as I can to kind of hit some of the major points that are in the book of Romans. And some of you have never been here for a single week of this. Some of you have been here for several weeks, but not all, and some of you, kudos to you for being here every single week since June 16th. I don't know who that person is or those people, but I know that there are some. And, and so for those that have never been here before, you might hear and go, oh, that's some great stuff, and that'll help me, that's good. And for those of you that have been here every single week, don't just think for a second, oh, man, I've already heard all this stuff before. Let me, let me tell you why you shouldn't have that attitude. Last week, we finished up uh, chapter 14, right? So this week, if we were going to go the logical progression of things, you'd be in chapter 15. Well, look, if you will, at chapter 15 in verse 14. And then we're going to jump all the way back to chapter 1. But look what Paul says here, almost at the very end of the letter. In 1514, he says, I am fully convinced, dear brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness. And I believe that of you. I think you, you folks are pretty good folks. I really do. I really believe that with all my heart. He says, you know these things so well, you can teach each other all about them. And I believe that of you. I believe that having sat through here for the last eight months and learned some things, and then, of course, your own private study, which I know Jared does every single night. <clears throat> and, and, and that was a good place for a laugh. Just in case you're wondering how to respond to that, that's a good place for a laugh. 
uh, for those that know some stuff, I believe that you could probably stand up here and teach this stuff, or you could go to your friends and neighbors and coworkers and teach some things about the book of Romans. I, I get that, but look what he says here. He says, you're full of goodness. You know these things so well you could teach each other all about them. But even so, I have been bold enough to write about some of these points, knowing that all you need is this reminder. So if, if Paul, Paul himself says, listen, I've taught all this stuff to you in person, and I know you know it, but it's good to have a reminder of these things. Now, why is that? Why would he remind them of these things? Well, I was thinking about that myself. You know, it, the more we understand what this gospel really is, what it encompasses, the more we can rest in our relationship with the Lord. If you understand where it came from, who it's for, how do you get it? Do you keep it? Do you not? You know, all these things. If you can understand, greater understanding would, would, would elevate our awareness of our salvation. And we can celebrate it more because we come in beat up. And sometimes there's that wonder inside of us, you know, did I do enough for God? Is he happy with me? I mean, you, you can ask Christians. I've knocked on doors evangelizing, and they come up with a big cross, and you go, hey, when you die, you going to go to heaven? Well, I think. What do you mean you think? Well, I've done some really crappy things. See, what God wants us to know is he wants us to know the truth about who he is and, who, and what the salvation's all about so we can stand firm in our beliefs and we can have some faith. And so the other thing it does is it gives us a greater understanding so we could have boldness to share it with other people, right? Now, I wouldn't, not like your husband, he fixes cars, right? So when you go up to him, he can and say, hey, my car's doing this. What is it? He has some confidence because he knows he's been trained. He knows motors and transmissions. So when you say, what is this? He can look at it, hear it, see it, smell the fluid, taste it probably, and tell you what's up. See, I can't do that because I've never been trained. I don't know. And so when we remind ourselves, and, and listen, who has, who has um, a job where you have to do continuing education? Oh. Continuing education, right? And you go, man, I don't want to go to this stinking thing, right? It's more of the same old crap. But you know what? You learn some things, and you sharpen your skills. And so that's what Paul's saying there. I know you know it, but I want to remind you so you can be encouraged, so you know you have everlasting life. And when you understand it, not only can you rest in it, but you can be bold to share. See, it's easy for a guy to stand up at a pulpit with his seminary degree and go, now go tell everyone about the gospel. And, 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 and people in the seats are going, well, I don't really know a whole lot about it, but you, know, you put a lot of pressure on me, you know, and I want to do it, but I can't do it, and then I feel worthless. You know, we don't want that. And so Paul's like, I want to remind you of these things so you can have understanding for yourself and then boldness to tell other people. When you understand the gospel and you're reminded of the fact that you have everlasting life, that's encouraging because you come in with all these battles and you feel beat down. And when you come in here and you're reminded of the gospel and the fact that you have everlasting life with Jesus, it takes your mind and your eyes off the temporal and it puts it back on the eternal and you can have some hope. So you're reminded of this great gift that God gave you. And who could be reminded enough that I absolutely do not deserve anything except death and hell, but I have heaven and glory forever because of God's love? How can that, that's an amen spot. It just, in, I mean, just in case you're wondering. Like, how, how many times can you hear that? Is, is, it, is it ever too much? Who, who, who feels like when their spouse tells them that they love them or their kids tell them they love them, you go, you know what, you've told me enough today. I don't want to hear it. Now, does that happen? No, of course not. You want to keep hearing it over and over again. So when you come in and you're reminded of the fact that, hey, you know, I know Paul said, you know, you guys are good people, but Jesus is going, yeah, you're really not that good. But, but I love you anyway, and I'm going to save you and give you the greatest gift you could ever have. So you're reminded of this amazing eternal life. And then, of course, you're reminded not only of eternal life, but eternal purpose. You know, when you're reminded of these things that, that I've, I was created by him and for him, you're reminded that in the morning when you wake up, it's not just to get up and go to work so you can make some money. It's to get up so you can make some money for the kingdom. It's, it's not just to go to work and, and make your boss happy. It's to make a good witness for Jesus so maybe he'll get saved. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you can go tell your coworkers about Jesus. That's why you're getting up and going to work. So give me some purpose, and you're reminded of that. And of course, if you have everlasting life and everlasting eternal purpose, then you have eternal fulfillment. And I think all of us want that. We want to know that our life meant something. And the gospel reminds us that you're special, 
You've been given a sacred trust. Inside of you, you hold the truth of the ages, and you get to share that with people. It's fulfillment. I want to know that my life meant something, and that's what the gospel does for us. Amen? The one thing that the gospel absolutely, positively does, and you find it in chapter 15, verse 4, it says that it gives you hope. It gives us hope. We, we, like I said, you, you come in with all your stuff, and you feel like, man, this is just awful. I mean, you just put on the news, you know, things are terrible. But the gospel gives us hope. Let me tell you why it gives us hope. It gives us a, a bigger view of our life, something that transcends, that's for you, Kelly, something that transcends your very small life, your little job, your little home, your little community, something bigger, you're bigger. It's in, you're in more involved with something that's larger. The reason why it gives hope is found right at the beginning of the book of Romans. In 1.16, Paul says this, and Paul's an educated, powerful, influential man. And he says, listen, I, all of that stuff that I am, I'm not ashamed to tell you this stuff means nothing. I am not ashamed of the gospel, and here's the hope, for it is the power of God saving everyone who believes. That's good news. So it gives us hope. It's the power. Like, I can't do anything, Paul says. I can't fix it. I'm not able to fix this problem. But it, the, the gospel is the power of God saving. It saves me. It gives me hope that something's going to change. Something's going to break. It's not going to be yucky forever. Better times are ahead of us. Now, for this discussion tonight, I want to focus on, in that verse, for just a moment, the, the word everyone. That's the key word for us tonight. The reason why that's the key word for us tonight is that Oh, but this is a whole new thing that Jesus is doing. It's a whole new thing. See, he's opening up his jurisdiction. See, see, all these nations, all these people, they, they're religious folks. They have gods and they have idols. They have all these fake things that they worship. And, and each nation, each people group has its own little god. You know, and what the real God comes into the scene, he goes, listen, listen, no, forget all that stuff. There's only one God. I'm the, I'm the creator of heaven and earth. I'm the creator of you and you and you and all of you. You're not in your own thing anymore. There's one thing. I'm that thing, and I made you all, and I want you all to worship me. So when he says everyone, it's no longer Jew. It's no longer Gentile. It's no, no longer this nation or that nation. Again, he's opening up his jurisdiction to every single person. That's not an easy thing for everyone to swallow, but this is what he says Chapter 1, verse 20, he says this. Um, let, let's go with 19. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. He's talking about since the beginning of time. For ever since the world was created. So is he talking about a certain nation? He says ever since the world was created, people, like every person, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks, and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. So what he's saying here is that every single person on earth, whenever they were born, they're Adam down to baby Lexi, everyone can look outside and just go, there's a God. You see creation, you see the baby, and you know there's a God. You hear music, you know there's a God. You see a tremendous work of art, you know there's a God. You see the nature, the, the hills, the mountains, the, the Grand Canyon, the, the, the Niagara Falls, the Alps. You know there's a God, there's a God, there's a God. The, 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 the creation is screaming that there's a God, and everyone knows it. But the problem is, is that every single one of us does wrong with that. We all know, he says, that they knew that I, was, that I was God, but they didn't respond well. They didn't worship me like I'd like. So even though he's God of all people, God of all creation, of heaven and earth, but yet, in chapter 3, he says, no one is righteous. No, not even one. No one is seeking God. All have turned away and become useless. No one does good, not even one. So he's opening up this jurisdiction to all people, and he says, you're all mine, every one of you have been made in my image to be like me, and none of you are doing it right. 
So, so what does he do? He, he gives the law. The law comes to his people. Then the law was there, what, to, to, to identify them as his and help them get along. There, people are killing each other and, and, and stealing everything. It's just mad. It's just read the Bible. You, you all know. It's, it's crazy. So he gives these people the law. And what happens is they say, well, uh, this law, if I just keep the law perfectly, then I'll be right with God. They, may, they almost make the law God himself. Do you know what I'm saying? They elevate the law so high that it becomes a God to them. They start doing, that's their worship, to follow the law. But the problem with the law is that God himself said he didn't give them the law to, pro- to solve the sin problem. He gave them the law to point out their sin. You see, so they were misusing the law. It's not given to us to cleanse us of sin or to make us right with God. Look in chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. 19 and 20. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses. And this is the universal indictment. And to show that the entire world is guilty before God. That's big. That's big. For no one, so he doesn't exclude any nation, any group, everyone, right? Including everyone in this room. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. I love sections of scripture that are just so easy to understand. You know, you don't have to have any conjecture. You don't need any commentaries. You're all guilty and no one can be made right by keeping the law. So it goes on to tell us that in chapter 5, we don't have to read it, but it goes on to tell us that the the problem with the law is that the law, although it helps us get together and and, and get along, and it identifies us because the law was given to these people, and so that's my people, and they're going to represent me. But the problem is that no matter how much you adjust your behavior, chapter 5 lets us in on a little secret. Even if you're perfect, it ain't going to cut it. The problem with it is that since the dawn of creation, when Adam and Eve came and they sinned, the sin nature has been passed down generation after generation into your blood. Every single one of us are sinners. There's nothing we can do. So even if you have this law of of proper behavior, it's not going to work because we've got sin in our blood. We're, we're, we're active rebellion. We're in active rebellion against God because we do sin, so our behavior is wrong. But we're also passive recipients of a sin nature that we can't do anything about. You can't fix your blood. And so God needs to do something. He needs to do something. As a matter of fact, it tells us in the scriptures that we were born, listen to this, we were born a sinner, born at the moment of conception. So if you wonder when you were born, it's not when you popped out of mama. It's when you started in mama. That's when you were born, okay? So at at that moment, you were born a sinner. So every single person is guilty for a holy and perfect God. But there's good news. In verse 21, it says, but, I love buts. Pardon me. Jared, you're a pig. That's not what I was thinking. Jared. <sighs> Do you guys think we should stop and pray for Jared? He really needs it. He needs a lot of help. But now, here's the good news. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law I was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We, this is it. Listen. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This is the best part right here. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who they are. Now that rubs us wrong, right? That rubs us wrong. That guy's a creep. Do you see what he did? I can't believe he's, no way, there's no way he's a Christian. And those that have been walking with the Lord, or so, or so they think, for all these years, and then someone who's wicked and ugly and terrible, they give themselves to the Lord on their deathbed. Oh, no way. There's no way. Like, God can forgive me, but there's no way. They can, well, yeah, but they can't forgive him. So I'll receive grace. I didn't deserve it. I'm wretched and rotten, and I'll get it. But oh, not you. Right? That's the way, and it rubs us the wrong way. But the scriptures, the gospel tells us, look, this gospel is for everybody. This gospel is for everybody, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, if they'll put their faith in Christ, they are saved. Amen? They are saved. Okay? Now, 
Here's the thing with, with this, this rebellion, this sin, and everyone's guilty of it, right? That's what the Bible says. Everyone is guilty of it. So, so how many people in here have a job? Right? And when you, when you work, did you fire him today? <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Oh, he needs a raise. Amen. Amen. All right. Yeah. All right. Woo! Did you say it was okay? Oh, the chief financial officer said it. All right. You're good. All right. So you have a job, right? So what happens? You work, and what do you get? Hopefully, you get some cash, right? You get some money. Well, the Bible says that you get the same thing for your sin. You get paid for your sin, too. It's death. How many people raise their hand on that one? You don't want that one, right? So it says that the wages of your sin, the payment for the work you're doing in your sinful nature, that blood thing that you've got a problem with, that act of rebellion against the holy God who loves you, that those things that you do and that thing that you are in your blood, that's death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's the good news, okay? That's the good news. Now, it's weird because it rubs people wrong because all these religions worldwide think you have to do some things to get right, including the Jewish folks where this all started from. And a lot of that, a lot of you got to do this and you got to do that. But what happens is Paul comes in with this completely new reality, this completely new reality that, that hits the planet and it goes crazy and it just says that the behavior and practices that you do, it's just not going to get it done. It's not going to get it done. It will not make you right with God. Your religion will not make you right with God. And God establishes, hear me out, he establishes his own religion. And when I say that, religion of man means I got to do some things to get right with God. I got to do some work to get right with God, right? Well, when I say God started his own religion, the reason why I'm saying that is because, you know what, there is some work to be done, isn't there? There's some work that needs to be done. Something has to die. Something has to die. And God says, I'll do it. So this whole new reality is that there's a new religion that says, yeah, there's work to be done, but God's like, I'm going to do it all for you. You don't have to do anything except trust me and believe in me. That's it. I'll do all the work. You receive all the blessings. There's a universal indictment. And he says, listen, everyone... This is the example in, in Scripture. When I tell you that there's a religion and God does all the work, I never want to just say stuff without backing up with Scripture. This is what it says here in Romans 3, 23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, that's an amen spot, declares that we are righteous. Listen, He did this through Christ. He did some things, right? When He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. See, he does, he does all the work. There's a religion. It's God's religion. He says there's some work to be done, and I'm going to do it for you. You just need to say thank you and say, by faith, that's for me. I don't save. God does. And he goes on in verse 27. So therefore, since God did everything, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? Is there anything that we could say, no matter how good you are, no matter how many times you open the door for little old ladies, no matter how many times you lay your jacket down over puddles, no matter how many people you hand out money and food on the corners who need it, those are all good things, and Christ's love should compel you to do that. But those are never going to get you in approval with God. He already loves you all he's going to love you. He's never going to love you more. He's never going to love you less. And the only way you're going to get into glory with him is because of what he did in accepting it. It's not being earned. And he says, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. There's a universal indictment. There's a universal need and a universal salvation that is open to every single person, no matter who they are and what they've done. So, now, what, what happens is chapter 5 through 8, there's a little bit of transition. See, leading up to that, it all talks about everything that you are and everything that God has done to save you. As a matter of fact, in, in the beginning of the book, Paul says that. He says that I've been appointed as an apostle, given the privilege and authority as apostles to tell the Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them. So the first couple of chapters are about what God has done for us. And we transition, Paul does, from uh, chapters 5 through 8, talks about us a little bit and our response to what God has done for us. 
i.e., your choices. This is a big one, right? This is when you really come into the picture. It's your choices. Do we decide, based on what God has done, to continue on sinning? Or do we decide to be holy and righteous and pure? Do we decide to continue to to follow the the temptations and the needs and the cravings of the flesh that say, I want that, I'll have that, I don't care who it hurts, I don't care who it offends, I don't care what's going to happen, I want that, it's going to please me. Or do we start to follow the tug of his spirit upon us? And it's a choice that we have to make. And, and don't think that it's, that it's like, it, it, it's impossible. Like, some people get overwhelmed. Go, well, in this world, there's so much temptation, and I don't know if I can really follow the Spirit because I, there's just so much, and there's so much sex, and there's drugs, and temptation of money, and drink, and all these different things. Let me tell you, let me clue you in on a little secret. The Spirit that lives in you is the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And so if he can raise, a de- listen to this, it's the spirit of Christ. So he himself, okay, is in a cold, dark grave, dead for three days, body temperature down, totally whipped, beaten, massacred, stretched, and killed. And he's probably like 40 degrees now. And that spirit that we're talking about that's in you that could help you say no to sin, raise this dead man from the grave and he's alive. That's crazy, right? That same spirit lives inside of you. So do you think he could help you with your porn problem? Do you think he could help you with your overeating? Do you think he could help you with your overspending? Do you think he could help you with your sex problem? Do you think he could help you with anything? Is any problem you have, let me ask you, any problem you have as bad as being dead for three days? It kind of pales in comparison to the amazing miracle of the resurrection, doesn't it? But the truth of Scripture, the same truth that says don't lie, and you go, okay, I got that. That same book said that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you. So you could tap into some power there. You know what I'm saying? You could tap into that power. I believe with all my heart. I believe in the Spirit of God. And I believe in you guys. And I believe that if you'll tap into that Spirit, you could be pure. I believe if you tap into that Spirit, you could be holy. I believe if you tap into that Spirit, you could be righteous. Do you believe that you can? Do you believe that you can? Can I hear you? Please. Okay. Listen, you can. You can. Listen, you know what? I love this chapter 7. It's one of my favorite sections of Scripture because I can so identify with it. It's the part of the scripture where, where Paul says, you know what, I get that spirit thing. I get it, I get it, I get it. And we all go right now, I get it, I get it, I get it. All God's people said? I get it. You, one person said it right. Thank you, Pete. You get a cookie. Jessica, you get another cookie. I love chapter 7 because he's like, I, I get the whole spirit thing. The availability of the power but I also am so keenly aware of the failure of my flesh. And I know there's a war going on, and it really is hard on me. And we could probably all raise our hand if I asked you, is it hard on you? Because you know what to do, just like Paul. He's like, I know what I should do, but I just can't do it. I know what I shouldn't do, but I keep doing it. Anyone? Come on now, you sinners. Right? And Paul, I can relate to this. Because that's, that's me. I can relate to this story. I can relate to the guy in the scriptures who goes to Jesus with a sick kid and says, hey, heal him, and, and, you know, if you can. He's like, what? If I can? Well, don't you believe? I, yeah, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. I'm there, man. All of us are. I mean, I believe that Jesus went to the cross. I believe that what he did gets me to heaven. And that's easy to believe that because that's like way off in the future, right, for some of us. Spock died. I want to talk about Spock. We're going to talk about Spock in a minute, as a matter of fact. But, 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 but do I believe? See, it's easy to believe that almost because you're going to be dead. What do you got to lose, right? But what about right here, right now? Do you believe that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead can help you be holy and pure and righteous Amen. right now? See, I believe that with all my heart. I really do. I wouldn't do this. I didn't believe it. I believe it, and I've seen it. I've experienced it, not in my own life, but in your lives. I know it's true. But there's this fight all the time. There's this fight. And Paul's going through it, and this is what he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. He says this. He's going through this. 
And he says, oh, what a miserable person I am, exclamation point. Who will, f- have been like that? Man, <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> he says, um, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God, exclamation point. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the answer. So what's, what's he saying here? Is he saying he's going to fix every sil- single situation? That it's going to get better right here and right now, and you're never going to sin anymore. You're never going to have to deal with this anymore. See, I don't believe that's the case. Who's going to, who's going to save me, rescue me from this miserable life that's dominated by the flesh and, and sin? And I think that what God's saying here is, listen, brother, sister, it's not always going to be this way. I am going to rescue you from this life of sin and death and misery and hurt and pain. And I think what this is clearly, to me, conjecture, that one day he's going to die. He said the same thing to Peter. In first, uh, Second Peter 1.14, Peter says, the Lord Jesus has informed me that I'm going to die soon. And so one of these days, it's a fresh reminder of, hey, get, listen, Paul, Peter, get your mind off the temporary. Stop thinking about right here, right now. You're going to die someday, soon, and it's going to be better. So it's a reminder of our mortality and that it's coming. Can you hear it? Tick tock, tick tock. Eternity is rushing upon you. And it's a reminder of eternity that we're going to live forever. Remember when you came in that one week and we had string roped across this whole place, hundreds of feet of rope from every point in the ceiling going every which way like a spider web. Do you remember that? And then right over here, I had a little piece of red tape on this rope. That's eternity. And this is what you all focus on. This is what I focus on. This little 80 years I have right here. This itty bitty little 80 years that you can hardly see. And this, all the while, this is eternity. This is what, it's, listen, it's not going to last forever, brothers and sisters. Someday I'm going to rescue you from this thing. So get your mind off of it. It's going to be okay. Like, it's going to happen. And, 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 and to talk about your mortality, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's actually good. But, you know, this week was, a, this, this, this last couple of days was kind of tough for me because cause Spock died. I mean, seriously, because Spock died, Right? Live long and prosper? He's not living anymore. He ruined the whole thing. You know? Like, I can't even say that anymore. But, but here's the thing. Like, when, when, the people that were, the people that died, like, that were, they were entertainers and stuff when my grandparents were alive, like, we've been used to them dying, right? But this dude was on TV when I was a kid. I can feel it. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. It's getting close, man. You know what I'm saying? Spock died. Spock died, man. And I can feel it. It's getting close. It's getting close. But listen, he says, listen, it's going to be okay. I'm going to rescue you from this world. And I've gone, Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. In, in, in advance of this happening, when you leave this tent that you're in, I've gone and I've prepared in a, a place for you. I have a priceless inheritance Daddy gives us. The Bible says that no eye has seen, no, no, mind, no, no ear has heard, and no mind can imagine what God has planned for those that love Him. He says, I'm going to prepare a place, and it's a, it's a beautiful place, and your inheritance is priceless beyond rust and decay. There'll be no crying or sorrow, no pain, death, or tears. A heavenly body with no tendonitis or arthritis, no cataracts or heart attacks, no clogged veins and no migraines, and everything we have will be owned free and clear. Every Christian brother and sister will certainly be there. That was pretty good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Record that one, Mike Jock. That's for you, baby. And you know what? We have proof of that. Faith. We have proof that everything I just said is true, that God will provide that. Let me tell you why. Right there. The cross of Jesus Christ. If he could give his greatest gift right there on the cross, if he can give Jesus, certainly, 
certainly he can give us everything else that we need. If he gave us his greatest on the cross, the rest of it is no work at all for our Lord. And we should have faith looking at the cross as proof of it all. Now the movie, this life that we have as a Christian, you know, he's not talking about the gospel, he's not talking in churches that everything's going to be fruity and everything's happy and all that stuff. Now the movie does end well. The movie does end well, but it's not rated G, is it? It's not rated G. You know what? The Christian life is grimy, dirty, it's rough. What does Jesus say? In this life, you will have trouble, right? It's going to happen. If you've been a Christian, how many people in here think that it's all unicorns and Hershey's kisses since you became a Christian? Yeah. yeah. No, it doesn't happen that way. You know what? Christians still get cancer. Christians still get in car accidents. Christians still get divorced. Christians lose businesses. Christians lose jobs. We all do. Like in this life, you will have trouble. And you can see here in chapter 8 that, that Paul, he virtually echoes Jesus' words found in, in John 16, 33 that I just quoted to you. In this life, you will have trouble, but, there it is again, I love buts. Oh, wait, I shouldn't do that. I love buts. That was terrible. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, I don't even know where I went. I don't even know. I'm gone. I'm gone. I'm gone. In this life you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. But have heart. Jesus says, take my heart. I'm good. Death couldn't keep me in the grave. It's not going to keep you down either. You're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. There's something greater that you're involved in. You're called into this great story, this saga that's greater than this world. And I've called you into it. And I'll drag you out of this, to this torture. And it's going to be good. And Paul echoes these words. He says, listen, things aren't always going to be perfect. They're not always going to be perfect. Look here in chapter 8, verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? I love this one. This is crazy. As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. This is awesome, right? Listen to this. This is powerful right here. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. That's crazy, right? That's crazy. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, nor, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell could separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Nothing. He's going to love you no matter what happens. Like the movie ends well, right? But you know you're going to have some stuff along the way. It's not going to be just perfect along the way. He does work out all things for the good to those who love the Lord, but also, this is the part no one wants to quote, that are called according to his purpose. And what Paul's saying here is his purpose for you to show him glory might be that you get persecuted. It might be that you're, that you're, that you're praying like the lady with the surfing lady who says, God, how do I serve you? I want to serve you. And a shark bit off her arm. Maybe that's, your, maybe that's your purpose. Maybe that's what he's called you to. Maybe this thing that Matt went through when his, bur his body is burned, maybe that's what God called him to that on purpose because he knew that he would receive more glory through this man who went through that. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe persecution. Maybe pain. Maybe suffering. I don't know what it is, but it's not always going to be perfect. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be hurt. We're going to get cancer. We're going to die. It's going to be rough, but overwhelming victory is ours in Christ. That, listen, overwhelming victory is, 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 is ours in Christ when, when death has no sting. If you don't even fear the greatest fear in the world, overwhelming victory is yours through Christ when you don't fear death. It's overwhelming victory in Christ when the cancer doesn't kill your spirit. When you praise the Lord on your deathbed, overwhelming victory is yours in Christ. 
Overwhelming victory is yours in Christ when a slave can honor his evil taskmaster and serve him with a smile because he knows it's temporary because his mind isn't on the red dot. It's on eternity. His overwhelming victory is his when he knows that when he goes to work and he serves him well, as God has said, that maybe the evil taskmaster will come to Christ. The overwhelming victory is the slaves when he knows that he's not working for the evil taskmaster. He is working unto the Lord. See, when you're free like that, when the gospel sets you free, overwhelming victory is yours. Overwhelming victory is yours in Christ when a husband loves his wife and expects nothing in return. Overwhelming victory is yours when all these things happen and you say, it's all good because I'm saved. I'm a co-heir. I'm a brother in Christ. I'm a daughter in Christ. I'm going to glory. It's all good. Overwhelming victory is ours. Now listen. Here's a big one. Let me have a drink. Here's a big one. This is this is this is a real Paul really tightens the screws down here. The gospel causes you to want to die. The gospel causes you to want to die. What do I mean by that? Christ's compassion is so strong. That not only when he comes into Jerusalem, he sees all these people that are highly religious, trying to do good, keep laws, trying to get along, trying to govern right, trying to do right by him, doing the sacrifices and all that kind of good stuff. But he comes into Jerusalem and he cries. He looks at all these religious folks who are trying, and he cries. He says, man, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're like, they have no clue. And it, and, 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 and it just breaks his heart. And his compassion is so, so strong that he's willing to suffer and die so that I could live and that I could flourish. And Paul says somewhere in the scriptures, I don't know where it is, but it's in there. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't just put a sticker on your car. Don't just wear a cross. Follow me as I follow Christ. Christ's compassion for the hurting and the lost, the massive sin pool, is so strong that he's willing to suffer and die that they might live and flourish for eternity. And Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And so when you look in chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, look at Paul. The gospel of Jesus Christ has so pierced this man's heart. Listen to what his response is. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. That's crazy love. Jesus loves us so much that he's willing to die so that you might live. And Paul says, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus. I'd be willing to die forever. He says, I wouldn't even, I'd rather, I'd give up my salvation. If you, I would die forever and rot in hell if you could get saved. Who does such a thing? Is this descriptive so we could praise the Apostle Paul? Or is it prescriptive because he says, follow me as I follow Christ? That's for us. That's for us. Be willing to die that some others might have life. And he doesn't say, you know what, I want to do it just for the nice Jewish people. For the mensch. That's for you. He doesn't do it for just the ones who give good offerings. He doesn't do it just for the ones that are nice, just the ones that are tall, just the ones that are short, just the ones, and you can pick up, you can pick a subcategory all you want. What does he say? I would be willing to die forever, cut off from Christ, that all the Jewish people, even the the good, the bad, and the ugly, every one of them, he said, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, that all all these people might live. He's not selective, is he? It kind of gives us a fresh perspective on this, this salvation that's available to everyone, no matter who you are. And that rubs us wrong again, doesn't it? Because there's certain people that we just don't like. And they're beyond the love of God. They can't possibly, like I did, because I was a little angel, and they're not. Come on. And Paul says, listen, I would be willing to die for all those people. So my question to you, for us, who's our people? Who are your people? Is it the people in your neighborhood? 
Is it people in this neighborhood around our building here? Is it the people at work? Is it the people of Eustace, Golden Triangle, Lake County, Florida, America? Anyone? Everyone is your people, right? Everyone's your people. Well, what can we glean from this? Are we necessarily supposed to literally die? Well, we could certainly glean from this that the gospel compels us to sacrifice. It compels us to suffer. It compels us to forego some personal pleasures, which most often are pointless, to earnestly pursue souls for the king of glory. Let me ask you all a question. You don't have to admit this. You all remember about 10, 12 years ago, the massive TVs. They look like big fish tanks. You know what I'm talking about, right? The big screen, the 60 inches that were like this big and, and that thick. And people just, by the millions of people, just went and spent thousands of dollars, right? I need to watch Tom Brokaw. I need to see him in real life. I need to see Joe Montana's sweat. And they rush out and spend thousands of dollars so they can watch Maury Povich. Right? Now, show of hands. In the last five years, how many people have seen those for free on the curb or in the dump? Can you count the thousands of dollars that have been spent on acquiring stuff that is pointless? How big does Jerry Springer have to be Right? If you want to go to a football game, buy a ticket. Right? Go to the game. Go to the gate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, seriously, all this stuff, we think we need it. And it's pointless. It ends up in the garage sale or you see it on the curb. And it says free. These people spend like $2,500 on a television. And it's being... Please take it away out of my yard. Or I'll gut it and put an iguana in it. That's a good idea. That'd be a good idea. We could go into business like that. There's plenty of them on the curb. Listen, you guys remember that, that, that message I, 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 I preached called Butt a Brick? If you haven't, if you weren't here for that, I, I, I think you should go online and on our YouTube channel and watch it. It tells, I'm telling a story about when I went up north and I went to the cemetery and, and there's all these graves and the, you know, on a normal grave there's a name, there's a date, might even say a little something about the person, but as I'm going through the cemetery over in the graves that were in the 1700s, there's all these graves and names and address, not address, but, but born on, you know, born this day, die this day and some scripture verses, you know, that kind of stuff on a grave and all of a sudden I look down, there's a brick. And it wasn't just a brick that just happened to be there. Like, it was placed. It was a gravestone. And certainly that person, although I don't know, let's conjecture again, I don't know that this per who it was. I don't know if they lived a day or if they lived 60 years. I don't know if it was a man or a woman. I, I don't know anything about this person, but if he lived any length of time, then they had hopes and dreams and aspirations just like us, right? You have them. And, and, and certainly they had, this person had parents. And if you're a parent, you have hopes and dreams and aspirations for your children, right? And certainly this person had parents too, and they probably had these same hopes and dreams. But what happened was that over time, I don't know what happened to this dude or this chick. I don't know. That's all I see now is a brick in the ground. And this life that God knit together perfectly in the mother's womb, that, that was thought of before the foundations of the earth, that had, was created for some purpose, was created by him and for him. You know what's left of him? A brick. I know nothing about this person. And I don't know what they've done. There's no legacy. No one knows. It's just a brick. And Solomon in the scriptures talks about this, acquisition of things. And all these other life pursuits of, of money and power and education and, and, and palaces and women. And he says, I've, I kept no good pleasure for myself. And I've come to this conclusion. It's all big screen TVs. Every bit of it. It's pointless. It does nothing. It's red dot. 
All of it. And we got to get our eyes off of that and fix it on the eternal. I want my life, I don't know about you, but I want my life to mean something. I believe that God, when he knit Moses together in Joanne's womb, he had plans for me. He wanted to use me for his glory, and I believe the same thing for every single one of you. He's knit you together perfectly in your mother's womb with purpose, and I want my life to mean something. I want our existence to mean something more than just acquiring things and money and homes and vacations. Those are all good things, and God blesses you with them awesome, enjoy them, and thank him for them. But the purpose of your life, I want, I want, I want our, our existence here to mean something. I want people to look 50, 60, 100 years from now and say that the world was changed because the people of revolution were here. I want them to look at our church and go, you know what, those people aren't just coming over thumping me in the head with the Bible, but they actually do what it says. Man, that's what the world's looking for, right? They're looking for authentic. Even if it sucks, they're looking for authentic. Really. They're looking for authentic. And this world would be different if we could be those type of people. And the scriptures tell us that the eyes of the Lord are going back and forth across the earth looking to strengthen those whose hearts are completely committed to him. That's what he's looking for. And he's looking, at, and he's looking at these different churches, you know, and he's looking, he's saying, hey, listen, are you guys fully committed to me? Do you realize your purpose? Do you realize why I knit you together in your mother's womb? Do you realize why I gave you such gifting? It was for me. It's for me. It's to bring glory to me. And he's waiting. <coughs> he's waiting for that church to go, yeah, that's us. <sighs> this past week, I was at that pastor's conference. You know, we started that thing, Harmony Eustace, with the pastors, right? We just started it about, what, four months ago? This past Wednesday, we met at the Church of Whistling Pines in between Eustace and Umatilla. Y'all know what I'm talking about on 19? We had 28 local church leaders show up. It was insane. Yeah. It was awesome. It was incredible. Listen, God's putting it on our hearts here. Not, it ain't just one lunatic. It's everyone. Everyone sees the need. Everyone knows what God wants to do in this community right here. Not somewhere else. Right here. My brother Andy, you guys know Andy, the guy's up here. He, he said, God in an audible voice said, I will launch a national revival out of the Golden Triangle. He's going to do something here, and he's waiting for churches to say, yes, I will be fully committed to you. This guy that flew down... His name is Mike Osminski. He's from Detroit. Detroit is so much worse than Eustace. Eustace has Orange Avenue that separates white and black. They got Eight Mile. You know what Eight Mile is, Eminem fans? Right, you don't cross Eight Mile unless you want to die. See, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's rough over there. That, 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 you know what this guy said? He planted a church there 15 years ago right on the road. He said that the cops, because he, he's been past, he was, he was a teacher at the public schools for 25 years. Now he's been pastoring for 15. He knows the community. It's right where he lives. He said the cops don't even pull people over anymore for this. He said most of the people that live there, right in the inner city, have no license and insurance. They don't even pull them over anymore because they're just looking for murder. They're just trying to stop murders. It's, it's got more murders than any city. It's a population that's gone from 2.5 million to 700,000. It, it, it's hurting big time. And, and so the Lord said to him, listen, I want you to bridge the gap between races and I want you to build a, put a, plant a church right on the road. And it's thriving, right? Thriving, thriving ministry. He flew down here and this is what he said. He said, speaking of the eyes of the Lord going back and forth, looking to strengthen those, he's looking for the churches that want to do this thing. He said, you know what I think? I think, I think God's sitting up there in his, in his house in heaven which is kind of funny. And, and on his mantle, this is just his you know, crazy idea, on his mantle, over his fireplace, because he likes fireplace, is all these envelopes. And they're taped to the mantle. And inside of them is power and a plan. And you know what he's looking for? An address. That's all he's looking for. He's looking for an address to send his plan and his power. And I want to be that church, and I want you with me. 
I want us to be that church. I wanted to send an envelope to 425 East Citrus Avenue, Eustis, Florida. That's what I want to see. And I'll tell you what, what will this city look like when, when Jesus and his church push back darkness so far that you can hardly find it? What will it look like here when we put a dent in hell? I don't know what it'll look like. I don't even know how to get there, but I know that's what he wants. I know that's what he wants, but listen, the only way that this thing's going to happen is if we, like Paul, decide, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23, he says, I do everything, someone say everything, I, I, I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. He says, listen, I don't wake up in the morning just to make tents. I wake up in the morning to make tents for the Lord. I don't wake up in the morning to just watch my kids. I wake up in the morning to raise my kids to know the Lord. I don't just wake up to have coffee with my neighbor. I wake up to have coffee so I can tell my neighbor about Jesus. He says, every single thing I do, whether I'm waking up, whether I'm going to sleep, whether I'm going to work, whether I'm going to the library, whatever it is I'm doing, there's no God time and me time. There's no God time and work time. There's no God time and leisure time. There's no God time and play time. Everything is God time. Every single thing that I do is to save people. That's it. And he says, you know what? I don't need the TVs. I don't need the palaces. My blessings will be shared. I will share the blessings of people coming to know Christ. I mean, I'm telling you what, if you've led some, I remember one night Shadiqua came into here. She was at the villages and she shared the gospel with someone and they got saved. I thought she was going to take my neck off when she hugged me. She was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read some. She was so excited. That's the joy. The stuff, it's pointless. You lead someone to Christ and they have eternity f forever, that's a blessing. That's the joy. And Paul's like, listen, I don't need this other stuff. Everything I do is to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Every single thing. He says, I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I don't. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. And how will they know? unless they are told. And that's what God does. He's been doing it since the beginning. He said he wants to talk to his people. He finds a prophet. He whispers in the dude's ear. He says, hey, tell him this. The guy goes and he tells him. Over and over and over and over again. And then here comes Jesus, the ultimate greatest prophet of all time, speaking. But he didn't even speak his own words. He said, everything I say is what my dad tells me to say. So he's speaking God's word to people. And then that greatest prophet ever, Jesus, he, out of his mouth, the great prophet says, I'm going to commission you all to be prophets. You're all prophets. So I want you to go to every nation because all of authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Like no one's higher, no one's mightier. No one can tell you no. I say yes, here's your permission slip. Go tell them, go dunk them, and go train them so they'll do the same thing that you just did for them. He makes us all prophets. <sighs> Chapters um, 12 through 16. It gets through 15 and 16, but you can check it if you want. But all those chapters are about personal interaction with purpose. First is about what God did for you. Then it transitions into how you respond to this gospel. And then after that, it finishes up the book. Paul's talking, like, woo, book. He finishes up the book by saying, now, keep in mind, this is how you're supposed to interact with purpose. Um, ten times in this, in this one book, it says, with one another. The words, with one another. And I think I've got them, yeah. Those are the verses. If you want to jot them down, you can check me if I'm wrong. But as you, check, as you write those things down, Jared, we have to establish. I can say that we're, we've got personal interaction with a purpose, but what is that purpose? What is that purpose? Why does Romans 13, 13 say to live this Christian life out before all, so that for all to see? Why does he say that? Here's our purpose. It's found right at the very beginning of the book of Romans in 1, 5, and right at the very end of the book of Romans in 16, 26, bookends. He says this, you live this life out for all to see. Why? So they can obey, they can, I'm sorry, they can believe, obey, and give glory to God. That's why we live it out. So people can believe, obey, and bring glory to God. It's how we live with one another. Jesus said, you'll know my disciples. You'll know that they're mine by the way that they love one another. 
So the gospel calls us to this new reality. And I know it's been said so many times, but to me, every time I say it or someone says it to me, I'm refreshed. And I hope it refreshes you. None of you deserve God's love or salvation. No one ever has sought him out the way he wants to be sought out. No one's earned it. You can't fix it. You didn't deserve it. You weren't looking for it. I couldn't fix myself, and you couldn't fix you either. But God's love for you compels him to send his son to save you. And the second thing is that the gospel calls us into loving community. When we treat each other within the church with unconditional covenantal love. That means that we don't love each other because we expect something back. We love each other because God's love compels us. And covenantal means that we don't run when someone ticks us off. We don't run when someone disappoints us. We're in covenant. We're a community of faith. And if we want to show the world what it means to be in marriages and to stick in families and to stick in churches, we need to lead by example. And so within the community of faith, we practice unconditional covenantal love, and then we express compassion to those outside of our church so they too might know and serve Jesus. The way we treat each other and the way we treat outsiders are two massively important key elements to the advancement of the kingdom of God. The gospel is the power of God, saving everyone who believes. So it is available to all people of every nation, every color, every socioeconomic level, whatever you are, it doesn't matter who it is, the gospel is available to every single person. And that's good news because we have an active and passive sin problem that we cannot fix and it separates us in relationship with God. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 51, the scriptures tell us, it says, who can worship this God? It goes on to say, only the blameless. Now we all know, not only from the scriptures, but from experience with ourselves and everybody else, that nobody is blameless. All have fallen. Every person sins. We all fail in many ways. That's what the scriptures tell us in our life. When we look in the mirror, we know that's very, very true. So we've hit a wall, haven't we? But the gospel breaks down that wall. For it is the power of God. It is the power of God's love. It is the power of God's spirit. It's his, it's his love that sends Jesus. It's his, it's his spirit that draws you to this Jesus. And then it's the power of the Son and his single act on the cross that makes those with faith to believe holy, blameless, and without single fault as we stand before this holy God now and forever. That's good news. That's good news. So, does this story help you understand the gospel in any way? Yes. Does this study of the, the book of Romans help the, the gospel, help you understand the gospel in any way? I, I, I hope it does. I know it's helped me. I hope it's helped you. Has it, has it given you some more security in your salvation? Has it given you some more boldness to be able to share the good news with other people? I, I hope so. But let me ask you this. Will we ever understand how God operates completely? No. And I, and I love this, and I'm going to kind of leave you with this. Paul, the guy who God chose to inspire to write this book, to explain salvation to us. In, in, in chapter 11, verse 33 and 34, he says this. I love it. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? So I, we're not going to ever understand everything that Jesus is. But we, we do know this, that there's not a person that's ever lived or ever will live on earth that deserves salvation, that can earn salvation, 
No one seeks him. There's no such thing as a seeker-friendly church because no one's seeking him. But I do know this. The scriptures tell us that no matter who you are, if you will put your faith in Christ, you have eternity. And nothing in all of creation can take, you, take that away from you. So this is what I want to do. I want to just, and listen, don't be, don't be bashful just because we know everyone. If someone here has never really, really done that, if, ne if you've never really, truly given your heart over and said, you know what, Lord, I, I, I can't get right. I, I've tried these different processes and procedures. I've tried New Year's resolutions. I've tried going to church. I've tried praying. I've tried learning. I've tried a new hobby. I try to play the guitar. I try to, I, I, I don't know. I try to be nice. I try to give to charity. But I've never really honestly given over the reins of my life. And I mean eternal life, forever. Let's talk millions of years. If you've never done that, there's no better time than the present. Eternity is rushing upon us. Tick tock. Tick tock, tick tock. And we don't know what tomorrow brings. So I just want to give you the opportunity, and I'd like everybody to just close their eyes and bow their heads with me for a moment. And, and for those of us that are believers, now is the time we can just thank Him. Just want to thank you, Lord. I personally want to thank you. I thank you for giving me eternal life, I thank you for giving me eternal purpose. Give me a reason to wake up every day. Something fulfilling. I want my life to mean something, Lord. You didn't waste matter on me. And I would just live and die. You invested that matter in me. That I would bring glory to you. And you invested matter in every one of us. That we would live for you. But somehow our lives would bring glory to you more. Every single person on earth was created in your image with value and worth to be like you, to bring you praise, to bring you glory. The only way that happens is if we're part of your family, Lord. So Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would draw in the, the people, the, the person, the people that right now want to be part of that family. That have never yet said, yes, Daddy, I want to be part of your family. Forgive me of my sins and take me in as your son or take me in as your daughter and usher me into glory whenever you're ready for me. Give me peace. Give me peace with you, Father. I only have peace if we accept the free gift of God, of Jesus on the cross. So if that's what you want, you've never done it before. No one's looking. I'm begging everybody to close your eyes. I don't want to have embarrassment or fear get in the way of someone's millions right now. If it's you, raise your hand. Praise God. Praise God. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for the hand that went up. I pray, Lord, that you will take what he has entrusted to you and you'll protect it for all eternity, that you'll pour your spirit out into that person, that you give him dreams and visions and give him great love for you. Grab a hold of him. Shake his world upside down. Take him on an adventure. Take us all on an adventure, Lord, as we seek to follow your Spirit's movement, much like the people did in the desert. When your cloud moved, they did. Help us to be like that. Anybody else? Amen. Lord, I thank you for your relentless pursuit. I thank you, Lord, that you never stop pursuing us. Thank you, Lord, for everyone in this room that has had the ability to, that God given to slow down and let you catch us and overtake us. 
Lord, help us to be agents of reconciliation. Help us to be people that, that live out all the implications of the gospel. Remind us afresh daily of your love and your mercy for us. Remind us of a, of a God that didn't need to but chose to show his great love to his people by sending his son to die, to take on the penalty of all of our sin. Don't ever let us get bored of that story, Lord. Burn like fire inside of us. Help us be the church that says yes, fully committed to you, Lord. Fully committed to you. We want our address on your envelope, Lord. Please, send it. We thank you in Jesus' name.